Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Kilford, and I'm the president of the Canadian International Council Victoria branch here on Vancouver Island. And I'd, I'd like to welcome our Canadian International Council members today, our guests, our panel members, and, and we're glad that you could join us today. Uh, nous sommes également heureux d'avoir notre événement uh, disponible en français aujourd'hui. And um, if you would like to listen to our event in French, you just have to go down to the bottom of the screen where you'll see interpretation and you can select uh, French. And then you'll be able to listen to uh, Stéphane Kouyak, who is providing our interpretation for us. And along the bottom, you'll also find a, a spot for Q&A where you can ask our panelists questions. And I'll do my best to get to all of them. We have over 200 people registered uh, today for our event, so we should have lots of questions coming in. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize that CIC Victoria members uh, live, work, and learn on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And wherever you happen to be joining us uh, from today, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people have always been at the forefront of the impacts of climate change across Canada. Indeed, uh, Indigenous leaders have consistently reinforced the need to address climate change and improve the ways in which the natural environment is respected and protected. As well, uh, as we will no doubt discuss today, their leadership and knowledge will continue to be indispensable to achieving the changes required today and in the future. And as we do think about climate change in the Arctic today, there's no escaping the fact that climate change is impacting everyone. It's real. And we only need to look at the forest fires and the flooding that have engulfed British Columbia in 2021 for confirmation of what lies ahead. Well, here we are. This is our first Canadian, our third, sorry, third Canadian International Council event focused on the Arctic and Halifax and Quebec City held events last year uh, along the same lines. And we've had the terrific support of our sponsor, uh, Davy Shipbuilding, throughout. And I know that we have a number of folks from Davy in the audience today, so a special welcome to you. For today, I'll begin with some background on what lies, on what has led us to gather together here. And after that, I'll introduce our panel members who will each give their perspectives and observations on the impact of climate change in the Arctic. And this is a conversation that will move from the strategic to the operational to what's happening on the, uh, at the local level on the ground. So we'll cover uh, a full circle of issues. Now, these events that we've had on the Arctic, uh, such as this one today, have come about as a result of something we call foreign policy by Canadians. And this was an event that we conducted uh, early last year as a joint initiative between the Canadian International Council, the Canadian Partnership for Women and Children's Health, and Global Canada. And we were supported by YouGov and Dr. Jim Fishkin with Stanford University and the Stanford Platform for Online Deliberation. So foreign policy by Canadians, what does it actually mean or what did it mean? What does it mean? Well, back in March and April of last year, we gathered 440 randomly chosen Canadians from all walks of life in a virtual environment to discuss issues touching on uh, global public health, security, prosperity, and human dignity. So over what was essentially a two-day period with our 444, and in 39 breakout sessions, uh, we learned a great deal about what is important to Canadians. I don't have time today to go into all the details as we're focusing more so on uh, what they had to say about the Arctic, but our final report can be found on the Canadian International Council website, which is very easy to find if you just Google Canadian International Council, and you'll sure to find us. Now, when it comes to the Arctic itself, there was a good deal for the 444 to reflect on. While almost all past governments have put forward northern strategies, none have managed to deliver so far. 
In her 2016 interim report on the shared Arctic leadership model, Minister Special Representative Mary Simon and now our Governor General said, and I quote, the simple fact is that Arctic strategies throughout my lifetime have rarely matched or addressed the magnitude of the basic gaps between what exists in the Arctic and what other Canadians take for granted. The Arctic is also geopolitically is also a geopolitically important region and global interest, as we all know, is surging as climate change results in Arctic waters becoming more accessible for shipping, fisheries and natural resources development. And at the same time, there is a growing international interest in protecting the fragile Arctic ecosystem from the impacts of climate change. Now we know in September 2019, the Canadian government also launched Canada's Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which is a very ambitious way forward for the next 10 years, with some $700 million in new and dedicated funding. The framework noted that phase two would happen soon after and result in an implementation plan. But as we all know, just a few months later, on the 30th of January 2020, the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern. And we've since had a federal election as well. So a lot has been happening that can easily disrupt any future Arctic plans, much as Mary Simon noted regarding past efforts. Now, circling back to our foreign policy by Canadians event and our focus on the Arctic, the majority of the 444 agree that Canada should strengthen its ability to maintain sovereignty and safeguard territorial control in the Arctic. However, along with this nationalist response, there was a compassionate one, with 88% of the participants gathered agreeing that Canada's main focus in the Arctic should be on enhancing human security in particular focusing on improving uh, economic and food security for our Indigenous peoples, which of course is tied to climate change. From, from the breakout sessions that we held back in March and April, I picked out some quotes to share with you today. Regarding the overall situation in the North, one of our participants said, and I quote, it's still a horror story, in my opinion, that there are a number of communities in the North that still don't have drinkable running water, which totally disgusts me. Another said, quote, you know, the indigenous people, every election the government says, we're going to do this for you, we're going to do that for you, and they do nothing. It's about time that we start helping our people. I mean, they are the original people of this country, and they deserve clean drinking water and food security. But pragmatically, someone else also said, I think having a strong thriving population in the Arctic is good for our national security interests. And then very candidly, another participant said, I think it's very clear that climate change is going to dramatically impact indigenous lifestyles, which are not going to be sustainable. So we either need to provide other ways for them to survive or help them to move somewhere where they can survive. And that quote alone provides so much for discussion, but that is what one of the Canadians in one of those discussion rooms had to say. So we certainly have lots to talk about today. And I'm delighted that we have been joined by our three panelists to help us make sense of things. So what I'd like to do now is introduce our three panelists, and I'll start with uh, Lisa uh, Copper Qualik. And Lisa, do you need me to turn your camera on? No, Definitely. you've got it. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. Yes. Hi. So for our um, folks gathered here today, I'm sure many of you do know Lisa. She is the Vice President of International Affairs with the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Uh, Lisa holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Concordia University and a master's degree in anthropology from Laval University. And she's also fluent in Inuktitut. Um, she did try to teach me how to say her last name uh, in Inuktitut, but I failed miserably. I just thought you should know that. 
Her work over many years has uh, focused on the issues of social justice concerning Inuit women and children, including as a researcher with the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Lisa's also been a strong advocate for Inuit political and economic autonomy, social justice, and the protection of the environment, culture, and language. And Lisa also has two boys, uh, the eldest involved in Inuit arts and the other a pilot with Air Inuit. Our second panelist uh, today is uh, Commander Corey Gleason. Uh, Corey is the former captain of the HMCS Harry DeWolf, our brand new Arctic offshore patrol vessel. And he enlisted in the Canadian Navy in 1985. And in addition to his recent command of the HMCS Harry DeWolf, during which, and this is an incredible story, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this, he circumnavigated North America via the Northwest Passage and then through the Panama Canal, Canal. So from Halifax past us here in Victoria and then all the way back to Halifax. And his first command was HMCS Yellowknife. And while in command, he proudly served as a roving ambassador for the city of Yellowknife and the peoples of the Northwest Territories. And our third panelist is uh, Maeva Gauthier. Maeva is a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria, and she uses participatory video as a tool to engage Arctic communities on global environmental change. Her research has amplified Indigenous youth voices from the North to address their concerns regarding social and environmental justice. And Maeva also works with the UNESCO Chair in Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education at the University of Victoria. So welcome uh, to all of you, our panelists. Thank you so much for taking your time to, to be with us and to share. And I'm now gonna turn the floor over to Lisa and I'm ready with your slides when you wish them and let's hear from, from you. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you for the lovely introduction. While you turn on uh, <clears throat> the uh, share screen to share my PowerPoint, I'll say thank you for the opportunity to listen and learn and share with you today my perspectives on climate change in the Arctic. In learning about the Canadian International Council's Canada Speaks series, I was very encouraged to learn that this series stemmed from the widespread interest and support for the North signaled from Canadians across the country. The Arctic is certainly a region of fascination for many, and increasingly this fascination is coupled with concern for how fast climate change is transforming the land and the lives of the peoples that have lived in this region for thousands of years. So I'm very glad to see conversations like this one today, hosted by the CIC and focusing on the Arctic and creating dialogue with Inuit. Critical aspects of the climate dialogue are indigenous governance and sovereignty for Inuit on our Nuna, our homeland, the circum circumpolar space that Inuit have occupied and used historically and to this day. Also critical to the climate dialogue is understanding that we cannot think or talk about climate change in the Arctic without also thinking and talking about health, economic development, security, education, language, and the list can go on. Today, I'd like to explore this vibrant and complicated picture of climate change in the Arctic with you. And three issues I'd like to look at are black carbon, marine governance, and indigenous knowledge. And they'll give you a taste of the dynamic, diverse, and rapidly changing context of the Arctic. You can change the slide, please. Who are we? We are marine people who live in the circumpolar region, and our homelands transcend national borders. And that really makes us an international people. 
Inuit have rights to a vast coastline and marine region. We call ourselves different names. In Chukotka, there's Yupit. Alaska, there are Inupet and Yupit. In Canada, there are Inuinate, there are Inuvialuit and Inuit. In Greenland, there are the Galahit. But together, we share one language and one culture. You can change the slide. We number 180,000 people, one people in four countries. We've long understood that to protect and promote our way of life in Inuit Nunad, we had to combine our energies and address common concerns and amplify our collective voice. That was why ICC was created in 1977, and the founder of ICC is Eben Hobson from Barrow, that we call Ukervik today in Alaska. Thus, ICC has been speaking on behalf of the Circumpolar Inuit on matters of international importance for over 40 years. And speaking with one global voice reflects the unity of Inuit as one people across the Circumpolar Arctic. Please change. We do a lot of things um, with some uh, principal goals in mind, strengthening unity among Inuit in the Circumpolar region. And we promote Inuit rights and interests on an international level and develop and encourage long-term policies that safeguard the Arctic environment. And we participate in various international fora, such as the Arctic Council, where we are permanent participants, and we hold uh, economic and social council status through the United Nations. We have uh, observer status at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and very recently, we obtained provisional consultative status at the International Maritime Organization. And I'm particularly happy to see these last two because we are the first Indigenous Peoples organization to hold observer status at the IPCC and uh, at the IMO, uh, which we received just last year. Next slide. So ICC's work is vast. And as I mentioned earlier, everything is interconnected. I'd like to point you to some of ICC's seminal documents that are relevant to our discussion. I won't talk about all of them, um, but around climate change. And I encourage you to take a look at them through our website. But the uh, first one I'd like to mention is the 2019 Circumpolar Inuit Declaration on Arctic Sovereignty, and that speaks to the rights Inuit have in Inuit Nunat, our Inuit homeland, and the value we place on our sovereignty. It is essential to any conversation about Inuit rights. And secondly, there's the 2010 Inuit Arctic policy document, and it's a strong example showing Inuit have been thinking about climate change and what needs to be done about it for some time. We've been speaking about it for decades. The policy clearly states Inuit should work towards sustaining their lands and territories by obtaining and ratifying a post-2012 agreement that will stabilize greenhouse gas. So those are two main documents I wanted to mention to you. Um, and so you see um, climate action by ICC has been going on for decades. So we have contributed to shaping the climate change dialogue internationally. Next slide. 16 years ago, when you can change to the next slide, um, then ICC Chair Sheila Watcloutier, who you may know, um, and she's published a book called The Right to Be Cloak, uh, The Right to Be Cold. Some of you may have read it, some of you may have not, but uh, she, in that book, she talks about the petition that she had brought forward to the Organization of American States to address that Inuit rights were being violated by inaction on climate change. Although the petition was unsuccessful, 
It was the first time Inuit used this strategy to address the urgent needs and show the world that the climate debate was about people and that Inuit in the Arctic were suffering. This was also the first time that human rights and climate change were considered together. And this Inuit-led action took the world by surprise and put a human face on climate issues that has become core to much of the climate change action and advocacy that's going on today. Since then, Inuit have continued to be strong advocates for climate justice, and we have worked to bring the holistic and interconnected context of climate change to discussions and decision making. So, for example, the various environmental impacts felt in the Arctic due to climate change have many diverse implications on our health, as you can see in this illustration. Next slide. Let's go to the three issues I mentioned at the beginning. Black carbon, marine governance, and indigenous knowledge. In the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere, we saw alarming information about the impacts of black carbon. Sources of black carbon can be local, for example, from ships, from burning garbage. And you know that in the north, um, all the garbage are collected on landfills. Um, there's uh, residential fuel and heat sources. And it also comes to the Arctic through long range transport from areas adjacent and not close to the Arctic. The impact of black carbon in our Arctic environment is accelerating the most pressing ecological problems in our homelands. It contributes to ocean acidification, causing detrimental impacts on our marine animals, and is a climate forcer driving global warming. And perhaps most concerning, ice melt is catalyzed by black carbon deposition on our sea ice. We're greatly concerned about black carbon in our homelands and we're working with others to find solutions, in part through our work on marine governance and shipping regulations at the IMO. Next slide. As mentioned, ICC works actively within the International Maritime Organization and recently received provisional consultative status. It's a place where it's really important to have our own voice heard, especially where issues of importance to our communities are discussed. Climate-driven changes are making Arctic waters more accessible, leading to growing international interest in the prospects for Arctic shipping, fisheries, natural resources development, at the same time, there's growing international interest in protecting the fragile Arctic ecosystem from the impacts of climate change, supporting safe Arctic shipping and protecting the marine environment and the animals is the utmost importance for Inuit. As Arctic shipping is also critical infrastructure for us. We bring crucial perspectives on the implications of increased shipping traffic in the context of climate change and what this means for circumpolar Inuit. Some of the specific issues we have worked on include advocating for the enforcement of the IMO Polar Code and advancing emergency response and phasing out heavy fuel oil as examples. And the vast and sophisticated Inuit knowledge base of the cross-boundary international maritime Arctic region is a knowing and understanding that no others have demonstrated. Our indigenous knowledge of this distinct region is an asset for the spaces in which we work. And this is the third and final piece I will touch on. Please change the slide. Often, I think of this, this man that you see in this slide, who was my uh, father who raised me. He was actually my grandfather, but he adopted me as per often Inuit uh, custom. And so when I speak to indigenous knowledge, 
it's him in the background speaking. Although uh, he passed away several years ago, uh, he would always encourage many, many to uh, value our language and be out on the land. He knew uh, for miles and miles around uh, our environment, our land, the waters. I'm also always impressed when I go back home to Bufanito and get rides in our freighter canoes to bring me to our ancestral family campsites. So it's always with my grandfather in mind that I speak to our indigenous knowledge. Our vision for the future is rooted in our past. As we bring our indigenous knowledge to these forums and share our knowledge with scientists and policymakers to understand the Arctic and the changes in our world. Only through engaging with our collective knowledge can we make informed decisions. We as Inuit and other indigenous peoples have been observing the natural world for a long time. And these observations have borne witness to the changes in our Arctic climate and to the innovation that allowed us to th thrive. These observations and knowledge signaled that change was happening in the Arctic well over 40 years ago, even before scientists were talking about climate change. Slide, next. In all we do, we bring indigenous knowledge to inform understanding and decision-making. I have put ICC's definition of IK, indigenous knowledge here. We bring knowledge holders and youth to meetings on climate to listen, learn and share our knowledge. It's very important for us to engage Inuit youth in climate action. It is only through utilizing all knowledge sources that we can understand the change happening in the Arctic to our world and make informed decisions. So uh, next slide, I've shared with you only a scratch on the surface about climate change and the Arctic and what we Inuit are doing about it and related to it. We're acting on the impacts of climate change. We cannot wait any longer. Climate change is not coming to the Arctic. It is here and has been for a very long time. We must simply act now. I invite you to look at our work, connect with us, and support Inuit-led climate action. Last slide. Nakokmik, Khoyanamik, Matna Khoyanaini. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Tema. Thank you, uh, Lisa, for providing that background information on the work you're doing and the concerns that you have in the in the Arctic. And um, what what struck me when I was looking at some of the effort that you have had ongoing, and you mentioned this that um, that you've been given provisional consultative status at the United Nations International Maritime organization, but not the full status. And from what I understand, mm -hmm. um, it was several countries with shipping interests like uh, Russia, Japan, the United Arab Emirates, and China, which actually voted against um, Inuit involvement, engagement. That's right. Um, what, what, uh, was there more to that story? Um, well, um we made our application over a year ago and um, of course it, it, there were some delays to review uh, all the applications uh, to become consultative status members of the IMO. Um, I'm not too sure what the um, uh, resistance was for for indigenous uh, participation to the IMO. Um, China is an observer, has observer status at the Arctic Council. Mm -hmm. So we are very concerned about that. Russia was quite vocal about not agreeing to our application. And I think um, we have a pretty good understanding why, because um, indigenous people's voices are, are uh, stifled um, usually 
And uh, China, uh, Russia is also, you know, a member of the Arctic states of the Arctic Council. So, uh, and we are members uh, as permanent participants at the Arctic Council. So we don't understand uh, why they would object mm -hmm. uh, to our membership. But in any case, we have uh, two years to show how we are engaged uh, at the IMO, and we're already undertaking some, some work uh, related to underwater noise in the Arctic, mm -hmm. where there's uh, not a lot of uh, research um, in that area in the Arctic. So um, we have our work uh, cut out for us. Yeah, and I think also it would be difficult at this point, and we have so much going on with Russia right now, I wonder how much contact you actually have with, uh, with the folks in in Russia that belong to your organization? Uh, to, oh yes, we have a uh, good contact with okay. them. They, they participate regularly with at the executive council meetings yes. and uh, on issues, but they have uh, limited resources. And um, <clears throat> when we have our general assembly, every four years, uh, they have a very good delegation. And, um, I might have spoken against uh, uh, Russia not giving Indigenous voice, but they they are chairing the Arctic Council right now. And one of the main uh, points that they've raised in their their guideline is um, the support. It's it's uh, the support for people in the Arctic. So they do support cultural projects. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a very good uh, interest in. Uh, the uh, cultural, uh, um, you know, pre preservation and language and arts. So that's a very, very good thing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lisa. I'll um, I'll move on uh, to to Corey, and uh, we'll come back to you later <laughs> on during the Q and A. That's for sure. And uh, I'm really delighted to have. Uh, Corey here today. We had an hour-long talk um, about two weeks ago, just chatting about his experiences uh, going through the Northwest Passage. I learned so much, including the fact that there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Cambridge Bay. That stuck with me, and it might sound funny, but I think it's also important because it reminded me of what um, Madeline Redfern had to say uh, on our first Arctic panel in Halifax. And uh, Madeline is a former mayor of Iqaluit. And she said at, at one point that we have to, um, the rest of us here have to stop thinking about the North as some sort of Narnia, um, which is of course C.S. Lewis's fantasy world of, of, and I wrote this down based on his books of magic, mythical beasts and talking animals. It, the point I think that Madeline was making, it's a real place with, with real people. And the collective we who live further south um, need to, uh, to you know, have a better understanding of what's going on up there. And when we were speaking, you certainly did that for me. So you were with the Harry DeWolf, you took it through the Northwest Passage, and you met a lot of people, you saw a lot of things. And I I was hoping that now you could share with us some of those key observations uh, that you had while in command. So over to you, Corey. Well, thanks, Chris. That's uh, a beautiful uh, 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 lecture that Lisa just gave. Listen, Lisa, thank you very much for that. I, I, I think you're a beautiful speaker. Um, and uh, I, I, I want you to know that um, you probably, maybe you do know this already, and I'll speak to the people uh, that, are, that are listening in. Um, the Canadian Navy has a steep tradition of affiliation. And affiliation is uh, building relationships with um, uh, its namesake city. So HMCS Calgary, for instance, is, a, is associated and affiliated with the city of Calgary, and they have, they have a really deep, tremendous relationship with one another. In fact, during the Calgary Stampede, when those folks go out to Victoria to visit the ship, they actually take ownership of the ship. They sincerely believe it's theirs. Um, <laughs> and so when we were building uh, the AOPVs, we were building six of them. And um, of course, affiliation was top of mind. Uh, and how are we going to uh, 
school up north. And is there an interest in affiliation with, uh, with a particular hamlet? And um, it comes no surprise to you that uh, the folks down south didn't recognize that the Inuit and the people of the north actually um, uh, look at uh, the Arctic in six different regions. Um, and uh, um, as we were building six ships, we started a conversation with the government of it to determine whether or not there's some interest in, um, in affiliation with uh, each ship with, with each of the regions. And fortunately for us, there was. Um, and uh, I got uh, the tremendous opportunity to be affiliated with the Kikatani region, which is the largest of the six regions. And uh, for the people that are listening, um, Kikatani region spreads all the way out to uh, Resolute, to the Western Arctic, all the way out to the Eastern Arctic, to Greece Fjord, all of Baffin Island, um, and uh, some, some other sister islands, and all the way down into Hudson Bay. And um, uh, we, we started the conversation of affiliation in 2017. I had the beautiful opportunity to go to Kaluit to uh, uh, visit with the premier at the time and uh, the president of the QIA, PJ, who's your new premier, or the new premier of none of it. Um, and the president uh, at the time, he was the president of the uh, Kikatani Inuit Association. And um, we engaged in three or four days of discussions. Um, the, uh, the governments uh, of Nunavut were incredibly generous with us, uh, with their time, educating us on the process of uh, their developing of their own government. Um, and uh, um, and we, we, we exchanged gifts and we made a commitment uh, to, uh, to affiliation. Now, what that is in the, at the end is really up to uh, our affiliate partners uh, without us pushing ourselves onto uh, the different folks in the hamlet. But I can tell you that when we went north this year, we visited Pond Inlet, uh, Grease Fjord and Arctic Bay. Uh, those were the only three places that I could visit at the time because I needed to make my way um, through the Northwest Passage and uh, carry on with the circumnavigation, uh, do some drug uh, interdiction operations further south, and of course get the get my crew home to their families at Christmas time. I suspect that people can appreciate that's uh, that's an important thing too. Um, but when we were north, we had the opportunity to uh, spend uh, three days in each one of those hamlets, um, introduce the ship's company to the uh, community and the community to the uh, ship's company. Uh, we had two-way conversations uh, with the community, uh, talking about the ship and experience in the Navy. And then, of course, uh, the, the, some, some folks were uh, perhaps brave enough to stand in front of a group of uh, sailors and tell them about their experiences up in the north, which was really quite fascinating. And we started a bond um, uh, together. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little touched, <laughs> really quite proud of that. But anyway, um, uh, I, I, I wanted to talk I wanted to talk to you about that um, and share affiliation because I'm hoping that a conversation uh, here uh, will blossom and continue on with the Canadian Navy as we move forward. But uh, before I kick off, uh, I just of course I, I, I need to personally acknowledge uh, that I'm speaking to you from the uh, Mi'kmaq Yi traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And I also would like to acknowledge I was talking to Chris earlier and I understand that there's some senior government officials. Uh, and likely some serving members of the military and some retired members of the military. And I'd just like to thank you all for your service. Um, so this is about climate change. Uh, so I figured I would just say a few words specifically about what the Canadian Navy and the Canadian Armed Forces are doing specifically uh, to uh, work up in the Arctic and uh, what's driving us uh, to, to get there. So, and, and you know, it's a beautiful segue, Lisa, you really helped me out uh, as, as you were moving through. It's almost like you, you knew exactly what I was going to talk about. And you just handed me a, a gift and, uh, and you, you introduced uh, me into the next topic as, from an operational standpoint. So uh, from a strictly maritime standpoint, operations in the Arctic are limited uh, to the navigable season uh, for an ice capable ship. And roughly speaking, that's between uh, late June and mid to late October. As the climate changes, this navigable season is becoming longer and less restricted by ice. As, as Lisa's already pointed out, member states and commercial actors are being joined in the Arctic by adventure tourism, resulting in a requirement to find ways of controlling and monitoring the access to Canada's domestic waterways and shorelines. 
Uh, this new interest is not just impacting the Royal Canadian Navy or Canadian Coast Guard. It's also in, uh, impacting other government departments that have a mandate uh, to operate uh, in, in domestic ar Arctic and, and conduct security. They're being uh, impacted as well. And um, uh, there was a paper that was uh, published by uh, Treasury Board back in 2014 that talked about how other government departments have a, have a mandate to operate up in the Arctic and they're leaning on the Canadian Coast Guard on an opportunity basis to get that support. And uh, the, the Canadian Coast Guard, as we all know, are busy uh, and they, they, have, they have a service, their service to the Canadian government and the Canadian citizens up north and south. And, and so that opportunity basis uh, for different government, other government departments is really quite lean. Um, so uh, us bringing uh, these ships into service will, will help us um, as a whole government approach to uh, facilitate the operations and meeting the mandates of some of those other government departments up in the north and of course the Inuit. So within the last 25 years, the Arctic has started to see an increase in activity that was almost uh, exclusively commercial and easily regulated and monitored. A decade ago, only a few member uh, states or firms had the ability to operate in the Arctic. Today, state and commercial actors from around the world seek to share in the longer term benefits of an accessible Arctic. The RCN is part of a larger whole of government's uh, uh, effort that is committed to improving the safety of navigation and security. The Canadian Armed Forces upholds Canada's sovereignty through presence. A hundred years ago, that meant policing, exploration, and exploitation companies with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Sixty years ago, Canada showed presence through technology and the construction of a vast early warning system across the north. A few ships and the Canadian Forces uh, Station Alert operated at its peak with 500 sailors, soldiers, and airmen. Much of the maritime surveillance was supported by the Dew Line, Canadian Army Rangers. Uh, Maritime Air Patrol, Canadian Coast Guard, uh, and, and their ships as they provided service to the community and in the industry. The RCM works as a part of the Canadian Armed Forces and collaborates with other government departments to help address safety, security, and environmental concerns. To do this, there's a series of working groups and committees that have been working together over the years to organize resources and coordinate Canadian Armed Forces personnel and equipment to support government mandated work in the North. And I've been participating in a lot of these committees throughout the years. The Canadian Armed Forces have developed and implemented a plan for the North, um, which consists of three horizons to be reached. And one of those horizons were actually reached when I first took command of uh, HMCS Harrier Wolf back in 2015. And that was the organization of committees, monetary commitments to build ships, uh, infrastructure and equipment specifically targeted for northern operations were all, were all achievements that were done in the first horizon. The next two horizons focus on putting ships and infrastructure to work and finally becoming fully operational year-round. I would submit the RCN is operating on the shoulders of the second or perhaps at the feet of the third horizon today. Uh, with Harry to Wolf uh, uh, recent uh, tests and trials up in the north in the dead of winter in 2021, its circumnavigation of uh, North America through the Northwest Passage this year, I would say that uh, I, I think we're firmly moving into the third horizon. So Lisa, thank you so much for that, for that, uh, that brief that you gave. It just gives me so much hope that our affiliation up in the North is gonna be really meaningful. Um, and I, I'll plant a seed because I'm a selfish person sometimes about these things. I was uh, at uh, Dalhousie a few years back in 2016, and there's a, a couple of ladies that uh, were speaking, uh, and the theme was rethinking the Arctic. And um, uh, during their discussion, they, they, I wouldn't say they complained, but they made an observation that government vessels come to the shorelines and the hamlets up in the north, and they go to anchor, but they don't engage in the community. And um, when I heard that, I was, I was a little surprised. I didn't really quite understand why that would be, but I committed that I wouldn't. That every time we went into a hamlet, that we, every time we went close to a hamlet, that we would engage with the community. And we've done that. Um, but uh, I wanted to go farther than that. And the Canadian Army has Army Rangers. And you said it yourself in your brief today that uh, uh, you're a maritime people. And I strongly believe that. And I believe that when the RCN is operating up in the north, that we can really collaborate and, uh, and learn so much from the Inuit who are, who are maritime people. And I, I have a dream um, and uh, you know, I, 
I don't want to push myself on onto the people of the north, but certainly uh, I can share my 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 vision. And my vision is um, initially similar to across the country. We have 24 naval reserve divisions across the country, where we have uh, young people from uh, from the different regions uh, participate in the navy uh, with the navy, uh, uh, going to school, going to university, uh, um, and they go to a naval reserve division, simply a building. Um, and they get in uniform and they participate. And in summer months, uh, when they're um, uh, completed um, their schooling, uh, they'll go to the coast and go to sea with the Navy. I see an opportunity here that perhaps we can do the same thing with the, with the, with the youth of the, of the North. Um, and uh, I, I know people scoff at me and I don't like it, but they do it anyway. Um, I, I have a vision that uh, we can have uh, some of our uh, young people up in the north come on board the ship, don a uniform for a period of time, participate as crew, um, and engage with us. And perhaps one day, one of those young people will be a captain. That's my dream. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, for that. And um, it, it, it's it's so good to have that that perspective, because I think I, I would agree with you 100%. And I'm going to talk about CIC in the north as later, because I, too, have a dream just like yeah. you. <laughs> Um, the, and, and just, you know, the fact that the Navy's up there, um, along with other, uh, you know, the army, of course, the air force, it's just in preparing for today. I, I learned so much. I mean, part of doing these events is learning. And one thing that uh, struck me, uh, I was reading that we actually have a, a, a 18 icebreakers in our, in our Canadian coast guard fleet, which makes it the second largest icebreaking fleet in the world. And I have often thought that we were totally hopeless. So um, we need to do better. There's no question. But but um, and then and then in May 2019, we filed this 2,100 page submission on the outer limits of our continental shelf, and and that oh. includes us claiming the North Pole, oh. along with Denmark and Russia. Um, I I really didn't I didn't know about that. I knew the Russians had planted flags there, but. But we get, we're obviously being quite aggressive as well because we're recognizing with, with climate change that, that there is a bit of a race going on here to position yourself for what's coming. So um, it's good to see that the Harry DeWolf is there and that more of these Arctic patrol vessels are on their way. So I'm going to turn over to Maver now. And, and Maver, thank you for joining us today. And um, how did this happen with Neva being here? We happened to, uh, is, it, is it in December? We were at uh, a sit down in person dinner, if anybody remembers what those were, but we actually do that out here in Victoria. We've been sort of lucky during COVID, um, you know, we've had to adjust, but we had a chance to sit down at this uh, dinner put on by the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria. And I just happened to be sat next to Mava, and I said something about, oh, I've got to do this Arctic panel. <laughs> and Mava said, well, hang on a moment. I know a thing or two about the Arctic. And so that's how it all came about with Mava uh, here today. And uh, I know for some of us, uh, some of you, you may have, uh, have, have seen the, uh, the clip from uh, a video production that Mava and her, her team of young folks uh, did up, up north. Uh, but uh, anyway, enough for me. Mava, the floor is yours. Tell us about climate change and what you've seen at the local level. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to join this panel. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm also uh, based in Victoria uh, on the Quangon's people's territory um, on the land of the Songhees and the Squamal Nations. So I'm really grateful to be here and be uh, raising my family here. And uh, really glad, Chris, that we got to, uh, well, to meet at the Center for Global Studies and then to sit down for this Christmas dinner. It was really nice uh, until things shut down again for a few more weeks. Um, so I'm... Uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I've got uh, a short slideshow and I'd love to show as well the trailer that the youth have done uh, from Takti Aktak. So um, I will just share my screen right now. Please let me know if there's any issues. Are you able to see okay? Yes, we can. Yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> so um, really I'm hoping to do today is to bring the Inuvialuit 
youth voices to this uh, panel. Uh, I, in an ideal world, I would love for them to join us. <laughs> and uh, maybe in the future, there could be an event with uh, youth engagement, which would be awesome. Uh, but today, um, I'll share a little bit more about my research, which is a community-based research where you do research with the community and for the community. <clears throat> and I've been working with the youth in Taktiak uh, for the past uh, three, four years uh, on an issue that matters to them, which is climate change. And uh, there's a lot of people involved in this project, so um, I'll name a few, but I'm working very closely with Michelle Tomasino at Mangila Luke School in Taktiak Tak, um, Candice at the Taktiak Tak Community Corporation, and of course, uh, some of our youth filmmakers, and uh, Yara Malinowski, who's our um, mentor filmmaker, who's been uh, really awesome at engaging the youth and showing them some of the tricks. And so why the Arctic? I guess just to give you a little bit of background, my, I did a master's in marine biology and I was, um, I had the privilege to go to the um, Coast, Canadian Coast Guard Edmondson icebreaker back in 2009 uh, for six weeks. So that was quite the, I would say life-changing moment for me in, in terms of, you know, discovering, like ex experiencing the Arctic. Um, and also the fact that we didn't have that many people from the communities going on board. And so uh, we had some youth from, um, from Labrador towards the end of the trip. But uh, for me, it felt a bit like a disconnect. They're like, okay, we're doing all this science, but I wanted to learn more and, and listen more from the communities. So uh, hence my interest now to uh, do more human geography, working more with coastal communities um, in the North. But for me, that was definitely like the, the aha moment in terms of, uh, you know, having this new uh, interest for uh, this place and for uh, people living in the communities. So why Taktiak Tak for me was the, um, the fact that I knew a teacher there, Michelle, and uh, it's always great, I think, to start a project when you have already some some connection in the community. Otherwise, it's um, it, uh, if you don't live there as an outsider like me, it's it's harder for sure to build those relationships and, and um, and work on a project together. So in 2018, uh, I went to Taktiak Tak for uh, almost two weeks and met with the youth at the youth center. We brainstormed some ideas around film projects and there was already an interest in learning how to make videos from them. So that that's great. And so we kind of started um, slowly at the beginning and then <clears throat> Later on, 2019, uh, we did a film workshop. So I uh, was there for uh, five weeks or so, brought the family with me, and uh, the youth were really engaged. It was uh, two and a half weeks, very intensive. Um, and um, we had youth from 15 to 19 years old involved. Actually, some of them were in the Rangers program and very passionate about it. So I have to say it's such a such a great program in Taktiak Tak. Um, some of the youth, it was their career choices. So it's it's great to have that. Um, and so uh, that's that's a photo taken um, with Randall Polkiak who uh, passed away last year actually. So it was a very special moment for the youth um, to talk to with him by the side of the ocean uh, for an hour and a half with a fire. And he shared with us his experience in uh, saying observing change. So that was a very uh, special moment that the youth brought with them at COP25, the UN Climate Change Conference, in uh, just so about six months after the film workshop. They've done a film called Happening to Us. They chose the title because it's happening to them. So that kind of came out from the brainstorm we had um, during the film workshop process. And so they were uh, part of the ICC delegation. So uh, I think Joanna is, is on this, uh, is uh, jo joined us. She's, uh, I thought she's online today. So thank you, Joanna, for making this happen. Uh, so uh, um, Joanna connected us with Inuit Tabarit Kanatami and uh, we talked with ICC and uh, we were able to bring four youth from Takti Yak Tak to show their film multiple times to people from around the world. So it was an amazing experience. And um, one that they still talk about. And hopefully we could do more. Uh, COVID has definitely changed a little bit our plans. So just going back to uh, to Takti Yak Tak, uh, it's a, uh, it's, uh, the meaning of Takti Yak Tak means place resembling a caribou. 90% uh, of the population is in Uvialwit. It's a village of about a thousand people. 
And it used to be a base for oil and gas development in the 70s and 80s and brought a lot of services in this, in this town. And um, it's currently the only Canadian Arctic village accessible via all year road. So uh, since November 2017, there's a road you can drive all year round. Before that, they used to have the ice road only in the winter. So it did change a lot in terms of um, tourism in town. So when we were there in uh, 2019, there was a lot of people actually uh, uh, driving to Tak Tak to start a big journey all the way from the north to the south. So uh, it was fascinating to see uh, people from all over the world. So uh, just driving under this, uh, this film project is uh, my, my research questions are more around how, what do youth identify as their primary concerns and climate change was a big one. Uh, living in, in two worlds is another one. So they often feel caught between the traditional and the modern world. Um, and so, so many things are connected so often when climate change is brought up, uh, well, how does climate change affect you when they were being asked at COP25, they often mention their culture is really affected. So everything is so, and so connected. Um, I'm also very interested in learning more about how, how do youth mobilize around those issues of climate change and what strategies might help amplify those actions. And so uh, some of the youth were so engaged, we were filming that night uh, on the left side. Uh, it's actually night time, but you, we can't really know because it's, uh, it's about midnight <laughs> uh, in June. So it's almost daylight all the time. And we were filming a uh, pretty long day that day because the light was turning orangey. It was really, really beautiful. So um, some of the youth really got to get out of their shell, started to really enjoy doing interviews. And so they interviewed community members, they interviewed themselves, youth to youth, they interviewed some scientists who were in Tak Tak um, studying coastal erosion. And so uh, their film really integrated different voices, their voices, also community members, scientific voices. So um, climate change is definitely really happening fast um, for the community in Tak Tak uh, They filmed Noelle Cartney's house on the left side here in June 2019. In August 2019, only <laughs> just a few months later, the house was really, really close to, to falling in the water. Uh, it's one storm, you can lose one to two meters sometimes, they were saying. So it's, it's um, the storms are coming in pretty, pretty hard. And so now, now that's the house where it is now. So it's been relocated that year. That was uh, a year or so ago. They relocated four houses more inland. So they have a relocation plan, which is a 50 year relocation plan. And it's happening and it's a sensitive topic. Um, some people want to move, some people don't want to move, uh, and uh, we're hoping with the next stage in their film to explore more of the solutions that they feel, what the solutions could be, and, uh, and touch on the relocation because it's definitely something that is happening right now. And so um, when uh, we did the film workshop, uh, there was a really great timing in terms of the release of the National Inner Climate Change Strategy. And that's when I met actually Joanna at the point right there. And uh, also a delegation of people, including Nathan Obed, uh, president of Inuit Tapari Kanatami, and Catherine McKenna, former minister of the environment and climate change. And um, we were able to get five minutes with her, but actually she enjoyed the youth so much that she actually spent at least 20 minutes chatting with them and listening to their concerns. So there was a great, great experience for the youth involved. Uh, this is Daryl there with my daughter in 2019. Oh my gosh, she was so small. Uh, we had a, a film screening in the community. About 70 people came. It was, uh, they were really proud of the youth and uh, we were really proud as well. And um, this is happened, the, the little uh, office that we see there is the TAC TV office. So they have film gear, they have uh, IMAX. Um, so they, they can technically take on film projects. So they're all equipped now to do more and uh, we're hoping to go back in the spring to uh, continue on their film. So using participatory video, which is making video with the community and, and mentoring them and making their own video on things that matter to them is, has been really great in terms of youth engagement and bridging the gap between youth and policy makers. Uh, a great example is at uh, COP25, uh, they had multiple live uh, film screenings, but they also spent 
And now we're in half with uh, the ambassador of Canada in Spain, Matthew Levin. So it was an amazing experience to be um, in the office and they were talking, Aaron and, and Matthew talked quite a bit together and the, the issue of social justice really came up. And, uh, you know, it's hard sometimes to know what changes what does it change, you know, when to to have those discussions? But I'm sure at a, at some kind of personal level, it does bring in uh, that personal bringing in that personal face to climate change, right? When they they get to talk face to face. So um, there's been lots of attention. They've done interviews with CBC and and, and um, also northern um, journals like uh, in, in uh, Inuvik. There's this Inuvik drum and. Uh, there's been a lot of attention recently. Uh, aerial loot that we see on the picture um, was featured at Canada House in London as one of the uh, Inuit um, leaders uh, in Canada. So that was an amazing, uh, amazing thing as well that happened from this. So, uh, well, I don't know if I have time to show the trailer. Maybe I can, it's a three minute trailer. Let me know, Chris. Uh, otherwise I'd be happy to, to share the link if you, um, if you want to no, watch I, I it. think I think you should show the trailer because I think okay. it's, it's quite powerful and Great. I think the audience would really appreciate seeing it and then Thank we can you. move to Q and a mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I will just share my screen for the video. It's a three minute trailer of their 22 minute film happening to us. Um, oh, let me just um, share with the sound that's going to be optimizing for sound. There you go. Oh, thank you. Any changes? Well, there's been a lot of changes. We could late freeze them in the fall, like we used to travel, uh, start driving dogs over the ice in the middle of uh, September. In October, we used to build igloos. Every year is it's different. Like it can get can it can get warm or it can get very cold. The water has, the water sea level has dried a little bit it's ever since I was 13. Like I looked at the ocean sometimes when I was 13, 14, 15 to 19, water level has been getting higher and higher. Well, I've noticed that there is less beach to walk on and there's a lot of <laughs> permafrost melting. You can see here, there's a lot of erosion happening. At that time, the shoreline was way out and I had no problem driving the vehicle over and behind my house. Um, but, uh, but now, in 2015, um, three storms took most of it, took close to about 20 feet off of it. And then uh, and it's just been getting worse and worse ever since. Those are things that I go to bed worrying about, whether or not there are going to be char in 40 or 50 years in Nunatsiagu, or what's going to happen to our caribou. And these are all linked to climate change. And so that's what really drives me to work on behalf of this issue. Well, I just think that kids should be very aware of climate change. And I think that we should all take it serious because we are the next generation and we can make a change in the world. People may doubt us, but it's what we have the power to do anything. Like what my dad again, he always said, have determination, determination and effort and nothing will be impossible. So yeah, just be aware and prepared. I like your words, Ariel. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mava, for sharing that. Um, certainly, your um, so first of all, I have to say the the, the 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 photo you showed, and you said it was midnight, and of course it's um, incredibly bright outside. I, I think people who live in the north, they or in Norway, they get that. But it's a good reminder for some of us down here that this is the sort of thing that you know the lights are on uh, year round, and I would imagine there are times when it's also quite dark as well. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah. the youth we have to adjust to their schedule uh, for sure. When when we were there, and uh, often the youth go to bed very late in the summer because. This it's so bright outside. So we started the film workshops often late in the day, adapted to their lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think showing the video and and hearing what you had to say is so important because you know quite often if I'm reading anything about the Arctic, it's about the fact that China is a near Arctic state and they're interested in the militarization of the of of the Arctic and so on. But the the, the video shows that there are real people. Um, out there at the end of the day and your video has actually created a quite quite a lot of interest in the in the uh in the chat area um people would like to know how to get a link to your your video and uh if, if we can get i can get that from you offline and i'll email everyone yes. um but some questions came in for you about that and um first one of the questions is about your project um potentially supporting language revitalization and preservation uh, and are you planning to also extend your work to other communities in, in the Northwest Territories or throughout the North? Yeah, this, there's been a lot of interest. Um, Candice from the Taktiata Community Corporation presented the project at Arctic Net Conference in 2019 at the same time as the youth were presenting their film at COP25, pretty much. And there's a lot of interest from other communities to do like a youth to youth mentorship project. So we've been talking about that. Of course, COVID has caused some delays, but we, we, uh, we are hoping to bring in more projects, more opportunities for the youth to kind of build on their skills. Also younger, younger students at the school who are interested in filming. And we did some remote engagement with the uh, Inuvialit Communication Society. There's some filmmakers in Inuvik we've been working with and they've been doing some engagement there. Um, so trying to kind of build on more cohorts, more youth involved and, and potentially some exchanges. So um, it's, uh, mm -hmm. we're hoping to go back in person uh, this spring. So it's COVID has definitely some, created some changes in our plans. Do you have an eye on COP27? It, it would be great <laughs> for sure. It would be great if, if we're able to make it work, yeah. Because a lot of, I think a lot of that work was done in, in coordination with the ICC as well, yeah. um, which I thought, Lisa, was an interesting link with your organization that we're actually seeing some, some, some dynamic things happening um, <laughs> uh, through, through circles of cooperation. Um, so we also have some other questions that I'd, I'd like to, uh, to touch on. Um, Corey, for, for yourself, uh, we have a lot of icebreakers. Well, perhaps not a lot, but we have some. And they're uh, breaking up the ice. And, and um, uh, Ken here in Victoria was wondering, if is this, does this somehow also impact the melting of the ice? Um, is there a plan to transition icebreakers to zero carbon emissions? I mean, is all this activity just making things worse, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't think there's a lot of research been put into it, to be honest with you, but I can tell uh, the person who asked the question is that uh, um, ships don't go break ice for the sake of breaking ice. It's that that's not, uh, we will avoid it if, uh, if, if there's no requirement for us to uh, get, get through it, to get from point A to point B. That's the first thing I would say to that. Uh, the other thing is um, uh, like for the Canadian Coast Guard, when they're, when they're providing uh, uh, ice breaking services, um, to shipping, uh, that shipping is actually working to deliver uh, to hamlets, uh, deliver fuel and, and food and product uh, to, to the hamlets. So that service is necessary for the, uh, for, for the folks that are living in the hamlets. Um, as far as the Canadian Navy is concerned, uh, we do not uh, uh, make a mission of going to break ice for the sake of doing it. That's not what we do. Mm. Um, to the question with regards to carbon emissions, uh, I mean, let's face it, those 18 icebreakers you talked about, they're getting old. 
mm. uh, and they need to get replaced. Uh, the Harriet Wolf class uh, that's coming that's in coming into service. Uh, Harriet Wolf is in service, and more so is Margaret Brook. It's a diesel electric platform, and uh, it uses different techniques to uh, to reduce emissions. Um, this ship is so um, uh, good on gas that uh, we could uh, we demonstrated this this year uh, that we can go from Halifax to Esquimalt on one tank of gas. So it's really just sipping fuel. Um, uh, and uh, it doesn't need a great deal of power to, uh, to, to kind of power itself through uh, the Northwest Passage. So uh, I, I would submit that zero emissions, uh, I, I'm not sure that the technology is there. I, yeah. I think we'll get there. I think uh, electric ships and things like that will be something in, in that, that'll be a possibility. Um, but I don't think that we're there just yet. Uh, but we, uh, we're certainly, the National Shipbuilding Strategy is certainly working towards uh, building smarter ships that um, that that uh, burn less fuel. Uh, we can run uh, uh, less cost to the uh, taxpayer, and uh, are have the environment in mind. Yeah, thank you, Corey and and, and Ken. Uh, your, your question is actually really important because, um, as you know, Davy is our our sponsor, and uh, they uh, built the first uh, well, their first. Um, uh, the first Canada's first modern heavy icebreaker was the uh, Canadian Coast Guard ship Diverville. That was in 1952, and our Coast Guard uh, icebreaking fleet is old. I mean, it it is. It's been refurbished. Um, most recently, we saw the um, the the Canadian Coast Guard ship uh, Molly Cool uh, delivered from Davie in 2018, and it was it was the it's the first sort of upgrade in 25 years. So, Ken, your question about carbon emissions. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we're behind on this. Uh, fortunately, as Corey said, we have a national shipbuilding strategy that's designed to ad address these issues. So um, things things will get better. But but it does point to the issues that we we currently have. And you know, um, Lisa, I wanted to come to you for this question that we have about um, cruise ships because we know cruise ships are popping in and out. Not so much recently because of COVID, but but likely there'll be more uh, people coming up and visiting the north in the future. I, 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 you know, I wonder about, of course, climate change, emissions, the impact on uh, our areas that we have preserved, uh, the impact on the people. Um, how much of a conversation is going on at the ICC about these issues? There's a lot of conversations we're having about um, several impacts that come from ships passing through Arctic waters. And these are very good questions. We're wondering how to reduce um, emissions from carbon-based fuels. Uh, um, we also want to prevent any um, terrible uh, tragic uh, spills that might happen from uh, heavy fuel oil. So uh, we're going to really be watching the transition to uh, um, other types of fuels, which can also lower um, emissions. So um, there's a group looking at uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, and the use of it by ships um, going through Arctic waters and, and how it will, how it could um, be better in, in many ways um, um, to transition to. So um, we want to see uh, ships um, uh, transitioning to to different types of fuels uh, other than heavy fuel oil because that's where where the issue is. So uh, I know there are countries uh, trying out ships um, all electric or or there's also ships now being used you um, with LNG. So um, that's starting, but there are many things to look at when using LNG. So you need uh, infrastructure to be able to to uh, fuel up um, if you're a ship uh, passing through the Arctic. Uh, you also, we also need capacity for um, cleanup of uh, those potential spills if they should happen. We also want to use ships using better technology to reduce underwater noise. 
um, there's uh, black carbon, of course. Uh, so it's really eliminating black carbon that's going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, IMO it, did uh, approve of a ban and they're in a, in a period right now of uh, waivers and exemptions. So um, it's going to be uh, just a few more years before we see the actual ban starting to be implemented and hopefully the waivers and, and exemptions will not be extended. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's lots of things that we can look at to improve how uh, ships uh, can reduce uh, their emissions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, there's lots of very, very good questions. Um, I saw one uh, question about China being mm. an observer. Uh, I was going to ask you about that because, uh, well, first, there were two things. Um, you know, I, I, at first, there was the fact that some Arctic communities are probably quite excited, I would think, about cruise ships showing up and having new sources of revenue. But then there would be parts of the community that may be a little bit more reluctant. So that's there's that social side to it yes um there and then is. right and 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 then there's china and and you at the arctic council uh they're there those observers mm -hmm. how do you uh, what, what's your feeling for the, uh, about about this i mean are, are they um really active participants or mm. are they just there to keep an eye on things how <laughs> have you had any yeah. exchanges yeah, well, locally, Inuit w w really want to show their culture, and that's one way they participate. Um, it, it's beneficial uh, for some communities where cruise ships go. And then, of course, there's uh, China being uh, observer at the Arctic Council, and they have uh, reasons for it. Um, the first time I really started hearing about China's uh, perspective it was at the Arctic Circle event in Iceland when I heard them speaking, um, one of the representatives saying, we are a near Arctic state. Mm -hmm. And to say that you're a near Arctic state means that you have some presence and you contribute to probably funding for research or um, things like that. But the real interest, of course, is economic and transportation, marine transportation is um, a very important um, incentive for them. So they want to shorten their transportation route. Uh, from their usual uh, long, long way around, they'd rather go through the Arctic because it just brings them uh, uh, quick, more quickly and more um, economically efficiently, I suppose. Um, uh, but um, their presence in the Arctic is also, you know, in, in the uh, extraction of uh, minerals. Um, there is a Chinese-owned mine in Nunavik. And another one I hear somewhere on an island in Nunavut. Uh, I, I'm not too sure. I, I, it has to be confirmed. But, but um, they, are, they are encroaching the Arctic more and more and we'll see it more and more uh, if, if they have the opportunity they're going to build more mines um, in the circumpolar uh, region so they have a lot of reason to be interested in the arctic yeah and i think they won't be alone i think others will will um will will, will start to pop up as as things develop and yes. And speaking of, of uh, you know, people operating in the Arctic, Corey, coming to you, a question was about why uh, potentially do we, we not go to nuclear powered ships? And um, that reminded me of our 1987 defense white paper when uh, Canada boldly said that we would acquire a fleet of 10 to 12 nuclear powered submarines. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, things changed. We didn't. Uh, I don't think there's any move on our part to acquire nuclear submarines. But before you do answer that, um, part of your role, too, is to actually listen underwater, isn't it, to, to check for submarine traffic in the Arctic. I don't know if you're able to mention anything about that as well. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the Harried Wolf class has a, has, has a you know, it's, it's, uh, if you recall, years ago, they were talking about a big honking ship. The federal government wanted just a big empty ship that they could do a whole bunch of different things with. 
Um, and that theme kind of followed in with the Arctic offshore patrol vessel where they wanted a lot of versatility in a ship. So support to, to, to science and research, a support to other government departments and uh, the capability to reconfigure the ship to do different things. Our quarter deck uh, has, a, has a sea lift capacity of 70 tons where I can put six sea containers back there. And when we, when we started looking at sea containers, I'll bring us back to Dalhousie for a minute. We were visiting with Dalhousie. They, they were looking at uh, getting on board uh, Canadian ships to go and do some of their own research because get, getting leased uh, vessels is really quite expensive. There aren't that many that are available. And so in bringing these ships into service, uh, we, we allow, our, we, we allow uh, Canadians to come on board the ship and conduct and support their own research, but we don't have labs inside the ship. Hmm. So uh, the, the answer to that was, um, if you take a sea container, you convert it into a lab. We can take that lab on an opportunity basis from some place where you place it close to uh, a jetty someplace. We'll take it, we'll put it on our quarter deck, we'll plug it in, we'll get you on board and offer where you need to get on board. You'll conduct your research. We'll keep your stuff on board, and we'll we'll, we'll bring it ashore. But same same thing rings true for the military, where um, uh, we took uh, um, a total array listening device, the transducer. We put it in uh, a sea container, uh, and we went up north. And during the sovereignty patrol, we were listening underwater. This isn't active, so there's this isn't putting noise in the water. This is just listening, uh, and a, a passive sonar device. Uh, for uh, submarines. As we uh, started, we started way up north in Greece Fjord. We went down through Lancaster Sound and into Larson Sound with, uh, with the transducer and through the Canadian waterways uh, to, um, um, you know, demonstrate sovereignty. Uh, to the question about nuclear submarines, I, I you know, I, I, I think, or nuclear uh, uh, icebreakers, for instance, I think it would surprise some folks to know that, yeah, Russia has nuclear icebreakers, but they can't go past the equator. They, uh, they, 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 they don't have a cooling system that would be safe for them to transit in, in, in warm, warm climates. So they're operating those uh, nuclear icebreakers, but they have to stay north. They have to stay in a cold climate. Um, notwithstanding, Canadians aren't fans of nuclear anything. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, our history has already demonstrated. I was, uh, I, I was a young sailor witnessing the Trident program many years ago. And the excitement of, uh, of of getting uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, there was folks that were going to university, uh, get you know, get, learning the the engineering aspects of, of nuclear power. Um, and you know, I was on a floor uh, here in Halifax that was just this flush with with people that were on that project. And when the government uh, made the announcement the next morning, I came back into that same building, and they were gone. Mm. Um, there, there, there is a strong uh, opposition against nuclear um, anything, and particularly in the in the military. Um, and I, I don't think that we're going to win that over, particularly in a climate change environment where we're we're all focused on 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 being smarter with technologies. That's just my opinion. Yeah, and I think it also shows us how time escapes us um, so so quickly. Um, one because our time is coming to an end here, but also you know we're talking we're talking about a government, um, bless their hearts, in 1987 who spoke a lot about the Arctic, the need to keep an eye on what was happening there, the need to keep the eye on, eye on the Russians and so forth, and even the U.S. Uh, as well, and, um, and and here we are more than 30 years later, and we don't have that kind of capability. It just things move so slowly, um, and. Uh, I think with climate change, we don't have the time to move slowly anymore. We can't let it go for 20, 30, or 40 years. And, uh, you know, uh, Don Scott, we didn't get to Don's question, but there is a need, and this is part of what we've been doing today, to educate um, educate what's uh, happening uh, in the North uh, with folks uh, across the country so they have a much uh, much better idea of what's happening. And mindful of the time, I see it is already uh, 4.26, so I should probably wrap up things. And I mm -hmm. hope our audience will stay with us for the last few moments, because I'd like to thank our panel for spending their time to prepare and then to spend 90 minutes here, which has been wonderful. I know a lot of connections are being, have been made in the chat area, which is good to see. I'd like to thank Catherine Hume in our national office for her support, Stefan, for your interpretation of events uh, today, of our event today, and of course the audience. 
um, who uh, include everybody from folks like me who don't know a lot about the Arctic to movers and shakers who, who do. And um, I think we'll be back in touch with everyone who took part um, in, this, in this particular event. And um, I'd also like to thank Davis Shipyards because they have been our sponsor over three events and it wouldn't uh, have been possible to have these events without them as our, as our supporter. And uh, Davy is also home to the National uh, Icebreaker Center, which uh, focuses on research, design, construction, and the maintenance of icebreakers. Um, this is really important for us going forward. We've talked about the aging of our fleet and the contributions that they're making now to um, uh, make things better. So thank you to Davy. And what about what comes next? Because quite often we have these events, at the end and we all go home and we don't do anything with it. So I don't think we should do that. First of all, I'm really proud to say as a CIC member that we, we have a new CIC branch in Whitehorse, CIC Yukon, and just has two members right now, but their first event is coming up on the 9th of February. So I'm gonna to circulate to everybody that was here today uh, what that event is all about. And we would like to have CIC branches across the North in, Iqaluit in uh, Yellowknife, uh, CIC Northwest Territory, CIC Nunavut, CIC Newfoundland and Labrador as well. Uh, we want to bring loads of Canadian voices into this discussion that we have not only about the Arctic, but other things that impact Canadians across the, across the country. So um, as I said, we'll be reaching out to you with more information about all of this uh, after the event is over. And of course, a uh, link to the video of this event and I will talk to our um, uh, uh, panelists about sharing their slides, uh, mm -hmm. Lisa uh, and, and Ava as well. And just before I do finish off, um, uh, Lisa, uh, Mava, and Corey, do you have any last words that you'd like to uh, leave us with? Lisa? Yes, thank you for this opportunity. I would really like to um, hark back to Corey and um, uh, affiliation. I, you know, when I went to COP26, I came back uh, with the thought, ah, I need to, we need to, at ICC, connect more with, with uh, other Canadians, fellow Canadians, people interested in working with us uh, on climate action. And uh, that way, you know, we exchange uh, knowledge and uh, work together to uh, fight more strongly against climate change. I would like to connect with you, Corey, very much. And uh, Maiva, I know we're going to connect again. I hope thank so. you, Lisa, Corey. So <laughs> thank yes, you so thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, I think you really hit it on the mark here, Chris, getting uh, the, these two ladies together. And uh, I, I bet you nobody saw the connection with the Royal Canadian Navy into this conversation with, mm -hmm. uh, with affiliation and the youth and things like that. Uh, thank you both ladies, uh, beautiful discussion. Uh, yes. I, 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 it was just really rewarding for me to be part of this uh, today, thank you. Thank you, Corey and Mava. <laughs> thank you so much for thank the you. opportunity to share uh, the voices of the youth from Tak to Yak Tak. And yeah, please reach out if, if you have any questions and and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to connect. Thank you so much for the opportunity for today. And I will get that link for the full video uh, from yes. you to let people know where to go to see it. So uh, everyone, panelists and uh, all of our viewers today on behalf of our uh, Canadian International Council National President Ben Rosewell, I, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time for joining us today. And uh, who knows, we might be back with some more events on the Arctic. So take care and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.